Did you? Well, I'm glad to see that even though the full title in here, we've got this little guy. So. I don't know what that's got to do with it. Yeah, very spiritual. Uh, we're on page 11 in that book, and we're not on page 11 in your Bible, but we're just going <clears> to... <throat> We're just going to, we're not going to really uh, read a whole lot um, at this point, um, but in the first, um, in the first paragraph, there's a quote of uh, Psalm 10, verse 1, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? <clears throat> and oh, could I get into that one? Uh, and the, my most two recent newsletters the name of the article is A God That Hides Himself. So this, and especially in trials and stuff. <clears throat> but um, what this chapter, chapter one is about, is about, let me, I'm gonna do this microphone and try to draw something. That uh, we have um, a chart <clears throat> and in that chart basically, there's a circle, and the center of the circle says uh, um, internal. So I'll just put internal, I, in, sufferings. And uh, that's one category of this, and yet a lot of times we never take that one into consideration. And then there is this other uh, reality, and that is being hit by external sufferings and in the chart here it says afflictions trials and persecution okay the afflictions and the trials and the persecutions and all of the bad things that happen in that sense are things that happen they're external to you <clears throat> all right well i don't care if you're a christian or a sinner or whatever you're going to experience external situations you can't get away from that and and I've had this absolute truth. I've had people tell me, <clears throat> you know, Randy, you talk about the cross and, and sufferings and trials and all this stuff. You know what? I'd rather be suffering for the kingdom of God than because I'm living a life apart from the Lord or not lined up with the Lord. You know what I mean? In other words, <clears throat> everybody's going to experience suffering. You can't get away from that. But, <clears throat> but I'd rather mine come because I'm after Jesus, you know. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so um, these external sufferings here, <clears throat> and let me make sure that we have something that identifies this outward circle. These external sufferings are things that just come into your life. And, um, and the bigger problem than the things that come into our life is how we handle those things. And that's where internal sufferings come from, usually, is that we start freaking out, we start getting, you know, our soul starts responding, we start getting into fear, we start getting into all of these things that, you know, well, God, why are you doing this? Or, you know, start rebuking the devil and nothing happens and we don't understand. And there's all these reactions and they are internal reactions and they just make everything worse most of the time. They're just us and they're not helping. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and that's what um, the scripture we read there in Psalm 10 is happening. Lord, why standest thou far off in time of trouble <clears throat> when maybe he's right there in the big middle of it? Maybe he's allowed it. Maybe he has purposes beyond just being a mean God that makes people suffer and just likes to see people suffer. Well, that's not our Father at all. That is not, that's not our Jesus. Jesus bore our sins and carried our iniquities and all of our punishment for us. So clearly, uh, he's in the business of uh, taking care of our needs. He wants to, he, he took it himself instead of us taking it. <clears throat> but, um, Clearly from the scriptures, as we'll see as we get into this book, there are things that he allows. And uh, I mean, the very first one I think we get into is the chastisement of the Lord. Do you think he allows that? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and, uh, and he's not mean because he does it. 
He's not mean because he chastises us. And so um, <clears throat> as we go through this, you, we begin to see the reaction is actually making the situation way worse. And, <clears throat> you know, um, sometimes, uh, like with your children, something bad happens and they start freaking out. And you, you got to get past the, the <laughs> all the internal freak outs that they're going through first before you can even talk to them about the external things. Same thing with husband or wife or something, you know. Uh, you might think of a, you know, a bad situation happening to the family finances and, <clears throat> and the husband goes, well, why did you go, you know, do this or, you know, whatever. Well, you know, a lot of that is our reaction to externals, which if you just think about it for a minute, we're really not supposed to be of this world. And what I mean by that is, is that this world shouldn't have that big of an effect on us. It shouldn't be motivating us that much. And especially, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just going to say to turn against what we love or, you know, that, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and, um, so uh, <clears throat> there's a few scriptures in here on page 12. At the last paragraph on page 12 is a scripture, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11, 27, and 28. And um, here we see Paul suffering both kinds of trials in, in weariness and painfulness, <clears throat> in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, those are all external trials. And then verse 28 says, besides those things that are without, meaning external, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. <clears throat> all right. So we can, <clears throat> we can have <clears throat> things hit us in the soul. We will have things hit us in the soul. Um, and those things can either cause us to react negatively or to, uh, if you read the, for example, if you read the prophets, you hear this a lot. The, uh, not just the word of the Lord came unto me, but the burden of the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> All right. That's not going to be a negative influence in your life if it's the burden of the Lord. It's going to be a, a negative influence if it's instead of coming from your spirit or through your spirit, it's coming from your soul. Your soul. See, in this case where the, he has the burden of the Lord for the churches, this is the burden of the Lord. This isn't his burden. He's bearing the burden of the Lord. It's not even <clears throat> resident within him as a source. It is only resident within him as a vessel. All right, so he's a vessel of the Lord in that. That's different. <clears throat> the other one is, is that we're the source. We're the, when it's our soul, we're the source of the freak out. We're the source because we have fears or we have doubts or we you don't know. You know, it's always the unknown that scares us, <clears throat> which which I perfectly understand, but I think that there comes a time when you no longer have to know and you no longer demand of the Lord to explain everything to you. You can just be with the Lord, you know, and you're, you're content to be with the Lord and you go, you know, it's like a, <clears throat> I think a lot of times the Lord doesn't explain it to us just like a a parent may not explain something to a, a much younger child because it, you know, maybe they would just freak out more over the situation or they just, <clears throat> you know, even the explanation isn't going to be enough. So you learn as a child to just go with your parents, you know. Okay, well, we're going to go to the doctor and get checked. Okay, or we're going to do this and that. And <clears throat> you don't have to, you know, a three-year-old, you don't have to sit down and go, okay, when we get to the doctor's office, there's going to be this 
you know, this receiving room where we sign a bunch of papers and then we sit down and then we wait for a long time and then we, they call us back and then you're going to sit in this other room and then a, the nurse will come in and take your blood pressure and this and that and eventually the doctor's going to come in and he's going to have this little thing and he's going to put it here and then there, you know, all this stuff and you go, okay, does that make everything better? <clears throat> the three O's going, look, I still don't know what's going on. That don't make sense to me. I'm just with you, okay? You know, I mean, that's how the three-year-olds talk nowadays. You know? I'm just with you, man, okay? You're my mama. You're my daddy. <clears throat> okay. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but we allow the outward, the external things. We allow that. That's not the devil. Those reactions are our reactions. The, even if the devil brings it, those are still our reactions. You know, we go, well, this is the devil. Well, yeah, well, you're the devil too. Not, not really, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I mean. You're not the devil. You're, he's your father, but you're not the devil. I mean, that's what Jesus said. You're of your father, the devil. <clears throat> However, when the enemy hits you, um, and this is just something that I've learned. When the enemy hits or something, some crisis happens, um, <clears throat> I mean, especially being a father or being a pastor, I, I realize that however I react filters down to everyone else, you know. And uh, in my early days when I was uh, a young pastor, I remember one of the first big crises hitting and I went, oh, my God, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? How's the church going to, you know, and, and going through all this stuff. And everybody else started freaking out, you know, going, oh, my God, is it over with? You know, <clears throat> and I saw the reaction and I realized, you know what, I need, to, I need to be able to handle these things and cover the sheep, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and those of you who know me over the years, most of the time, somebody comes to me with a big crisis, bam, right in front of I mean, I've been up preaching and had people walk up and go, you know, uh, uh, da 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 <clears throat> And I just keep right on preaching, and I don't go, you know, I don't freak out or go into anything, and most people couldn't tell anything was going on anyway. Because, you know, I don't want to, you know, send down through the body things that are not the Lord. <clears throat> and it's almost like being a pastor, my thought was, and I think sometimes being a father, you're this way, you think, um, you know, what I wouldn't do for me, I'll do for others. You know, in other words, maybe I'd like to freak out. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know, I just, you know, why can't I ever freak out or something, you know? <clears throat> but uh, you don't. For others you don't do it because because it's going to affect others I'm sure parents feel that and moms and <clears throat> everything else um, <clears throat> so let's see uh, on uh, page 13 there's the the top paragraph the bottom of it Philippians 4 11 and 12 it says not that I speak in respect of want for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content I know both how to be abased and I know how to to abound everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need <clears throat> and of course this is the the quintessential perversion scripture that people say you know well it is you know I can do all things through Christ so I can do brain surgery and I can drive an 18 wheeler and you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, I don't really think, I, you know, and that's usually how it's used. Really, it's used just totally out of context. of what. And he's saying, I can do all things, and the all things he's talking about here is he can, he can be blessed, he can abound, or he can do without. I'm with the Lord no matter what. You know, I just love Jesus, okay? Y'all got a problem, you know. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's, he's... He's just with the Lord, and I, <clears throat> I love how this says it. Um, of course, I know how to be abased, which, frankly, people, most Christians don't know how to be abased. There, you talk about internal sufferings. You talk about freakouts. Uh, I, sh 
why are you making me do this task at the church? I should be one of the, you know, big recognized important people, you know. Well, really, today it's just work day, and I'm just asking you, would you go in there and clean the toilet? I can't believe this. And he would ask me to clean the toilet. <clears throat> Apparently, you haven't learned how to be a base, you know what I mean? I was just going to say, I also think that believers don't know how to abound. Yeah, well, I agree with that, too. Forget the Lord. Right. <clears throat> it really is true. Um... My background, even before I came to the Lord, was that I, being abased was a way of life. I grew up in an orphanage, you know what I mean, and stuff like that, and the bad stuff that went on at home when, when we were living at home. And, you know, you just kind of, you know, well, life is just this, you know, and being abased. <clears throat> And um, early, when new creation started, people were coming everywhere, and the church was just filled up, and <clears throat> the tithes were big and everything, and, <clears throat> and, uh, and the, a bunch of the church members that had money were giving and wanting, you know, well, pastor, we want you to, basically, we want you to abound. So we would like for you to, you know, at that time, we were living in a mobile home, and we want you to get a nice, a nice house. And so some of them went with us and found this really nice two-story that wasn't that far from the church, and you know, and it's going, you know, here we'll we'll uh, <clears throat> we'll give you some money for now and whatever. Now they they didn't read the contract or anything, and apparently me and Deb didn't either, and. Um, what ended up happening was we had signed the contract and if we didn't do something within a certain amount of time, then they got to keep all the money that we put down, which was for us substantial. <clears throat> but there's this thing of, oh, we're gonna live in this nice house and you know God's gonna bless us because we're good people or whatever. And uh, when that happened, we didn't even have the money, there was, there was some stipulation and we had to give them some more money, so we sold one of our cars. I may remember some of that, I don't know. And we sold one of our cars and so we're in a little Chevette, Chevelle, Chevette, Chevette, the littlest of all of them left. <clears throat> and me and Deb sat there and we said, you know what, this, is, this abounding stuff is dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> And um, we need to, you know, we need to learn how to abound. And we weren't using that terminology, but we said we need to learn both, you know, because we'd never been exposed to that much. <clears throat> and the Lord's done pretty good since then. Um, but what Paul goes on to say here is I'm not just I know how to be abased or I know how to abound, but everywhere in all things, everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. And that I believe in with all my heart, that there is a state, a spiritual state, where you are so full, you're, uh, meaning you're so satisfied with the Jesus that you're getting, and that is so wonderful to you. And with all your being, you just love this Jesus, and you're, you're so full. But at the same time, you're hungry. You know, it's almost like, but I'm, I'm empty. I want more of this, you know. And uh, uh, I just love this because it, the, the wording, you know, uh, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed. Who do you think instructed him that way? Our friend, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Both. Both at the same time. Both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. <clears throat> and in that sense, we're not talking about external things. I'm abounding, but I need, you know, I need a new car or I need this or that. I, that's pretty much is the case anyway. You know, everybody's 
got certain things and would like more. This isn't the spirit of the world. This is a spiritual state of um, abounding in the Lord, and yet none of us has attained. All of us, you know, you, you, instead of saying, well, we all need to grow, we all need Jesus. You, we still need Jesus. You know, oh, no, I'm saved. I don't need Jesus anymore. I need the gifts of the Spirit. Well, you know what? You don't need those gifts in the state that you're in. You, you really need Jesus first, and then you can handle the gifts. You know. <clears throat> um, and then uh, the next subtitle on page 13 is Trust the Lord. <clears throat> and <clears throat> usually when you say that, for example, if, if somebody's going through something and they're having a crisis and they're freaking out and, and they would come to their pastor and they say, oh, pastor, what am I supposed to do? This is bad. I, need, I really need the Lord. Da, 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 da. Um, <clears throat> a lot of pastors would say what you need to do is trust the Lord. And that's good. But what they mean by that, what they usually mean by that is you need to trust the Lord to fix this situation. <laughs> oh, yeah, trust the Lord to fix it. And my little thing down here says trust the Lord for deliverance and trust the Lord in spite of deliverance. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, <clears throat> pardon? Hebrews 11 is a good one where, you know, it starts off with all the victories, but then you get halfway through the, the, the guise of faith. And uh, many of them wouldn't even accept deliverance because they wanted a better resurrection. They went deeper into death so that there'd be a greater resurrection. You don't find that a lot, you know. I mean, you usually find people wanting, you know, I want out. I want out of this. I want this gone. <clears throat> and that's the, that's the deal, isn't it? Okay. So if we get the external, Lord, if you take away the externals, the problems and trials that are affecting me, then I'll be okay. Then I won't have any internal sufferings. You see that? You see how that works? And that's exactly what people unknowingly are doing. Um, and it's, it's like Jesus uh, asleep in the boat and the disciple, you know, the storm comes up and all this stuff. And Jesus stays asleep in the boat. You know, and the disciples are going, get him up, wake him up. We have a problem here. Master, carest thou not? See, that's the first thing. We accuse him. Well, I, th this, is hap this bad thing is happening, and you're not fixing it. Therefore, you must not care. You know, I've had people come to me over situations, and I do absolutely nothing. And they go, well, you know, that Randy, he's just, I've, I've heard this before. He's indifferent not indifferent. I mean, I suffer along with them, but if the Lord tells me not to stretch forth my hand, my hand is not going out there. That's just the way it is. And I will not go against the Lord in that way. I won't do it. And, I, and, and I've, had, I've had New Creation Fellowship rise up at one point and just go, you know, <clears throat> it was when we were over on Maple and people said, we need to have a, 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 a youth program and we need to do this. And, you know, and I, my kids were that age and everything. And the Lord told me no. He said that we, if we do that, we're just doing it because of, we see a need instead of by Christ. We're doing it because we want our kids taken care of. Can't the Lord take care of our kids without a youth program? I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I know every church pretty much, you know, of people that are saved have a youth program. And how many of those kids, I mean, if the youth programs were working, the world would be changed by now because all those kids would have come out into the world and, yeah, and you know, and you don't after, you know, you don't hear of them anymore. It's like that, it's like that joke with a, a rabbi that had mice in his church, in the temple, you know, and he couldn't get rid of them and stuff. And he's messing with them and, you know, putting out poison and doing all this stuff, you know, and he was a young rabbi and so he goes to this older rabbi that has a, a big temple you know across town he says you know rabbi i've got these these mice and they're everywhere and i just can't get them out of a, the temple and they're they're messing with everything <clears throat> and the older rabbi said he said uh, son just 
go buy little yarmulkes. Yarmulke is a Jewish thing that you put it on there, then when they get bar mitzvah, then they can wear it. Just go buy little yarmulkes and put it on all of them and bar mitzvah them. And after that, you'll never see them in the temple again. <laughs> Uh, sadly, a lot of these youth never go back. They go, you know, and they seem so on fire. And the music, yeah, and, yeah, let's go, Virginia. And, you know, and I've seen that more times than I can tell you. And nothing almost, nothing almost comes from it. And so the Lord is telling me, no, don't, don't start it. It's not me. Uh, it's a lack of faith on their part that I can deal with the youth apart from that. And, you know, I mean, just for example, one of the youth that, well, two of the youth that was in that was Jason and Nisi. And now they're on the mission field. So I'm kind of okay with that. You know what I mean? I'm kind of okay with what the Lord can do. It's better than them just out in the world working at a bank or something is my point. So, and if the Lord tells someone to do that and that's the Lord, I'm okay with that. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying the fruit uh, of most youth groups is just not there. <clears throat> um, so anyway, uh, in that situation, there was tremendous pressure. You're the pastor. You need to make this happen. You need to do this. We need to have this. You need to do it. And I said, we ain't going to do it. I mean, it got so bad that I just said, look, we're not going to do it. I haven't heard from the Lord. In fact, I've heard from the Lord not to do it. So if y'all want to, you know, skin me, hang me on a cross, do whatever, you do what you got to do, but I'm going to be with the Lord in this, and I'll be happy with that, and whatever comes as a result of that, I'll be okay. And just so you know, that's happened more than you would imagine, <laughs> where I've, I've had to just, just be with the Lord and, and take flack. <clears throat> But it doesn't bother me, and I, I'm not bringing that up so that we'll go, oh, we need to be more sensitive. No, stay where you are, you know what I mean? If you want to grow, grow, but I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be with the Lord, so you don't have to worry. Whatever your reaction is, you go ahead and, you know, you'll eventually grow up in the Lord. And So I'm, I really, I'm genuinely okay with it. You know, it's like, you know, the Lord has brought me to a place where if, you need that. If you need someone to put stripes on their back, I really am okay with that. And God can use that. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, we have so many um, examples of deliverance from stuff, both in the Old and the New Testament, where God would deliver. And he does deliver. He does deliver. <clears throat> um, and I believe that he can be trusted. I mean, I remember also one time we were on Bolivar and a situation had happened. A particular person had control of the purse strings and, and pretty much spent all of our money. And I was, uh, there's a long story behind it, but anyway, I sort of came back to being the pastor, sat down with the elders and they said, uh, you know, we only got, you know, I forget what they said. It seemed like it was like $10,000 left, and it will be in four months with what we're paying right now, uh, we will be defunct. <clears throat> and one of my elders said, man, you know, it's going to take a miracle to, to turn this thing around. And I said, well, isn't it wonderful that we serve a God of miracles? And they kind of went, oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> You know, but we do. And he is fully capable of doing incredible, incredible things. And uh, I think sometimes we don't have faith for that. Now, I think sometimes people don't think I have faith for that, but they'd be wrong. It's just that I don't, my faith for Jesus or toward Jesus or in Jesus, period, is greater than my faith in Jesus doing a miracle. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, so, you know, in that situation, <clears throat> like I said, they said in four months we'll be defunct uh, if we don't do something. You know, we only got $10,000. So I told the, the finance elder, I said, uh, we'll take 5000 of that and send it to this ministry in California. And they all just, you, <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it really was. 
But, I mean, I, it was the Lord. It was the Lord. I mean, <clears throat> see, here's, you know, here's part of the point, and this is really an important point, is that we think if we need a miracle, what we need to do is just ask God to do it and to fix it when there's actual things he's told us that we can do. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want God to do a miracle in my finances. Do you, you know what I'm saying? And so, <clears throat> you know, I told the, the elders, I said, you know, let's just give. Let's give. And I, I told them, I said, if we go under, we're going to go under right. You know what I mean? I mean, I'd rather know that, that as much as we could, we did what we did right, and we did it in the Lord, and we blessed others. And we, you know, we no longer exist because we put Jesus and others first, not ourselves. I could live with that. You know what I mean? I could live with that. <clears throat> but their first reaction was kind of, oh, <clears throat> what? Randy, we're on the verge of bankruptcy right now. Um, give. Let's give then. Let's just bless others. Let's do, do it. Let's do it. And let's do it heartily as under the Lord. And they did catch the spirit of it. They really did. And I said, I said, okay, y'all got it? And they said, yeah. And I said, okay, let's write this check. Let's just pray over it. Lord, bless those people. And thank you that we had something that we could give to them. And they, all those men just joined with me, and it was beautiful. And the rest is history. We're still going, you know. All right. <clears throat> so there was a deliverance there. But it really wasn't because the elders said, oh, God, and we held hands and we looked to heaven and we went, we're going to shake the heavens with prayer. No, no, no. We're going to pull out our wallets and we're going to go give. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not putting down prayer over one. It's, if you got a headache, take an aspirin. If you got a cut, put a Band-Aid on it. Apply prayer where prayer is needed and giving where giving is needed. And, you know, you see what I mean? It's, it's to understand how this thing works and to flow with the Lord's heart. <clears throat> All right. Um, and, of course, <clears throat> trust the Lord <clears throat> um, in spite of deliverance. So you have the example of the three Hebrew children. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the king says, okay, I'm going to come through, or the, the guy talking about the king, the king's going to come through, and all of Babylon is out here, and we're all going to bow down. And when he gets here, as soon as you hear the, the sound of the, the sack button, the dulcimer, and the instruments of music, all of you fall down and worship the king and stuff. And <clears throat> so they, you know, they do that, and the, the three Hebrew children just stand there. And they go, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not falling down and bowing to this. Oh, my God. I can tell you right now that if you're, if you're in tune with the Lord, you, you're going to face that sooner or later. You're going to face those who have the power to break your knees to make you come down, to make you bow. But the three Hebrew children, I mean, they knew what they were doing. But there was something in them that just said, I am, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing this. I don't care what the consequences are. How many Christians are willing like them to stand, you know, with, I mean, you know, imagine all of Babylon falling down. I love a picture that was drawn um, with uh, Keith Green, and he used to put out a monthly little thing, and it showed that these three guys standing there in Babylon, and all of these people bowed down, and then it also showed the the king over there, and it showed one of the main guys, and he was pointing at these three going, <gasps> you know, and it was powerful because you realized, you know, that sounds like a great story, but if you actually are going to commit and you look and you see everybody else bowed down and how obvious you are and this head guy that's got the sword, you know, going to get him, you know, <clears throat> but they didn't, you know, they didn't. And you say, well, is there ever going to be a situation where I'm going to be in a foreign land and da 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 da, da just like that happen? Well, I'll stand too. No, no. There'll be plenty of opportunities for us to, to, um, to be pressured to, I, I'm sure. I know they have for me. I know they have for me. And be, just because they, they're, it's, it's the, 
this tremendous force of power, the king of Babylon, and you will obey and you will uh, give in to me. And they've got all the power in the world to just bring you down. And you just say, you know what? I'm not. I'm with the Lord. And I'm going to stay with the Lord. And I don't care what you bring on me. It doesn't matter to me. It, it's okay. It's going to be okay. I'm with the Lord. And so they take them to the fiery furnace. <laughs> you know? And, they, and uh, of course, the, the king's upset and everybody's upset. And he says, you know, make the fiery furnace seven times hotter than it ever was. Seven times hotter. Yeah, and you're going, oh, I thought this was a pretty hot situation already, you know. <laughs> but the funny thing is, of course, you know, you know the end of the thing. They didn't die in the fiery furnace. But here's the funny thing. If you ever read the story, the guys that were throwing the wood in to make it seven times hotter got burned up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, so they, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. And, there, and the king, you know, looks in there. He looks into the furnace, and what does he see? He said, he said, didn't we throw three guys in there? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, look, there's one like the Son of God walking around in there. And I remembered one time, you know, the way the wording was that the Lord said, basically, this isn't exact, but he, he said, I didn't say that I would deliver you from the fiery furnace. I said I would be there with you in the furnace. That's, that's so good. Because the deliverance is he could be up in heaven and I can be down here and he can just go and snuff out the fire and they go, all right, let him go, you know. Or he can be, he can be, he can be close. He can be with you. And you can learn what he learned on the cross, you know. And be with him in that instead of having to, having to have a deliverance every time in every situation. We've already dealt with that God does, if you trust the Lord, he can deliver us. And we believe in miracles and we believe in the, in the power of God. But now we're talking about, well, if he doesn't deliver us, we're still going to be with him. <clears throat> and somebody says, yeah, but that's an Old Testament story. Brother Randy, give me a New Testament story. Well, you know, Paul. Paul is a good example. I mean, he, he had a thorn in the flesh, and he prayed three times, Lord, deliver me from this. And God said, my grace is sufficient. Now, folks, most Christians, if, they, if some messenger of Satan, because that's the way it described it, if some messenger of Satan comes against them, their immediate thought is, you know, chase the devil off. <clears throat> um, and, and if God, if they prayed for deliverance and God answered, my grace is sufficient, they would say, well, I know it is, so let's get rid of it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That, that if it, that's the way we think. His grace is sufficient, so by your grace, remove this. But what the Lord meant was, that I, that in your weakness, you will see my strength. <clears throat> and if I have a choice, and of course, you have, there has to be discernment in all of this. You understand that. You know, there is no, there is no uh, thing, no template that I can just hand you and you go, okay, oh, that's this. And, Oh, that's, you know, this is the sufferings of Christ. Oh, that's the chastisement of the Lord. Oh, that's the, the temptations of Satan. Oh, that's uh, the testings of God. There's no template for that. You have to hear from the Lord. You have to be with the Lord. I mean, that's the whole key. I mean, he wants us to be with him. A lot of times Christians are only, you know, it's like, I'm doing fine. I don't need you, you know, and everything's good. And then when the crisis happens, oh, Lord, where are you? Why standest thou afar off? Well, because you pushed me there during your good times. <laughs> yeah. why aren't you close to me because you pushed all this material possession so close I can't climb over the wall of it <clears throat> I can't even get past your texting you know <laughs> but in that case the Lord the Lord said my grace is sufficient for you and the, and the grace was going to be that uh, and what I was going to say is if I could if I can 
if I can have the Lord deliver me and me continue in my strength, or I can have the Lord not deliver me and bring me to such a weakness that he becomes my strength, which do I want to choose? Okay. But mo much of Christianity doesn't think in terms of more of Jesus, less of me. They're thinking in terms of God is the winner and he's going to beat up the devil in this situation. And the one in the, in the New Testament situation with Paul, it says a messenger of Satan sent by God. <clears throat> so what we're going to have to discern, we're going to have to find out what that means. We can't just say, I don't understand that or I've never been taught that or that's not according to the theology that I understand. We have to say, Lord, that's in your Bible. Teach me what that means. And when I say teach me, I mean ask the Lord to open your eyes to those scriptures, not just listen to me or anybody else. I, see, the problem is we have listened to everybody that said they're a pastor or, or a leader in that. That's what we've done. We've just listened and listened and listened. Okay. So the answer isn't to listen to me. <laughs> I'm breaking the trend here. It's not. It's about listening to the Lord. When you hear the voice of the Lord, you'll know what it means, and it'll be life in you. If you just embrace it because you heard me say it, then you just, you're still devoid of the real power of it. And then, then you might end up submitting yourself to an attack of the enemy that you were supposed to resist the devil and he would flee from you. Do you understand? So, so the point is we need to be in a genuine actual real relationship with the Lord and walking with him and when we're walking with him we'll know you know we'll know he'll he'll let you know you know <clears throat> and that you know uh, the neat thing is he didn't just say my grace is sufficient for you he said my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in your weakness okay well once he says that you know what's going on you know what I mean? You don't go, well, could you just rebuke the devil for me, Lord? You know, you wouldn't do that. You'd go, I want your strength. I don't want to be in my strength anymore. I want, you know, I want that. And, and uh, the next chapter will be on uh, <clears throat> chastisement. And you see a similar thing there where there's uh, the scriptures in Hebrews talk about chastisement and all of that. But when you get down a little further in the scriptures, he says, so, you know, receive the chastisement of the Lord so that you might become partakers of his holiness, not just holiness. You know, in my opinion, it's dumb to teach holiness apart from God. I mean, I'm just, it's like, okay, well, that's just religion. Just beat us all to death, okay? You know, uh, and that's what some people do. That's what some people do. Um, I remember I was uh, in a place and the, the pastor was very harsh on people. And, and I, could see the, I could see the effect on the sheep. And service after service, my heart broke. I mean, there were literal services that I just broke down and cried, not because of what he was doing per se, but the, the reaction it was having on the sheep because it was just beating them down and beating them down instead of lifting them up to Jesus and and it's not so you notice I didn't say uh, instead of lifting them up I said lifting them up to Jesus because the goal isn't just to lift up because then you're just going to have nothing but happy services you know sometimes lifting people up to Jesus means you know if Jesus said if I be lifted up and he said this spoke he of the cross of his the manner of death that he would die um, but so I asked the Lord, you know, what was going on here in these services where that would happen? And he said, he said, he is, the, the pastor is taking the truth and he's beating them with it. And he said, what I want him to do is just put the truth out there and I'll correct them, you know. I'll correct them. I'll, you know, and I, and he, and he may, you know, the father sometimes can be more harsh than any man, you know, but at least you know that it's your father, you know. 
And uh, so anyway. Oh, we started late, didn't we? How much time we got? All right. All right. Um, so uh, I guess, well, I want to address this thing that we just talked about with the, the trials, the external trials coming in on the believer. And within him, he's doing all these freak outs. These external trials are hitting him, and he's doing all these freak outs, and um, and he's uh, he's not trusting the Lord, and he's letting fear motivate him. Motivate, be your motive, be your motive, and um, and it's all the all all of that lack of of trust and lack of knowing the Lord, because. Um, because real trust comes and, and increases with whatever degree we know in the Lord. Because when you know him, then you, you're trusting him. But if, if trust is only taught like, uh, okay, don't, you know, Everybody's saved, so you know Jesus, so let's just learn more Christian stuff. Um, and then a crisis happens, and you just say to them, well, you need to trust the Lord. Well, they've, they've, you've never told them you need to know the Lord. You know, in between the trials, know the Lord. Seek the Lord. Want, you know, go after him. And the more you know him, then you know what, how he is and how he responds and stuff like that. I mean, you know, probably a good example would be, um, you know, someone new coming to the church or the Bible school and, and they go, um, you know, well, I don't know this guy, you know. And, you know, someone could say, oh, well, you know, you can trust him. He's a good man. Okay, yeah, that. That's not going to really help if a crisis comes up. But if you, if you get to know that person and they are genuine and you learn certain things about them, um, uh, an example that, that I've used also was a situation where the Lord helped me through a really hard time was... Uh, I, I was basically after this crisis situation with someone that I loved very much, uh, and they just turned on me. I was laying on my couch in my living room, and I was just weeping and weeping, and, and I said, Lord, you know, take this pain away. <clears throat> and he said, um, no. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, I was hurt pretty bad. I was hurting real bad. And uh, so, but I learned, I know that if he says no, there's a reason. So I wanted to ask. So I said, well, or, or I thought it through and I said, okay, well, if you can't take the pain away, then take the in, any infection away, cover it so uh, infection doesn't get in there because, you know, bitterness and all that stuff can get in there and it, then you're just ruined as a minister and as a Christian, you know. And so I, I'm just, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to think through with him, and I was pretty young when this happened, you know, so we'll just cover it so I don't get a bad infection and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, he said, uh, he said, Randy, if you broke your arm and there were, you know, you had a choice of two different doctors and they both went to school at the same time, they both made the exact same grades, they both uh, graduated at exactly the same level and everything, and you had a choice between the two, and the only difference between the two is one of the doctors had had a broken arm before. Which one would you choose? I said, the one with the, you know, who had the broken arm, because he's going to be a little more gentle with me, you know what I mean? He's going to know what I'm going through instead of just going, oh, give me that arm here, here. Oh, quit crying, you big sissy, you know what I mean? You're going, this hurts. <clears throat> um, That was his reasoning. That was his reasoning for allowing 
me to feel this situation so deeply. And he said, it'll become valuable to you down the road because you'll be able to, you, you'll, some people, you can see the pain in their eyes. You can. Some people, you just get around and you know what that feels like and it's like, I know what that is, you know. And it's hard for people to believe that anybody can know what that is, you know what I mean? It's like, no, I know what that is, you know. And <clears throat> there is a communication across invisible lines many times that happens because people, people realize it and they don't even know you but they go, you do know, I, I can tell, you know, however you can tell. <clears throat> and it opens you up because, you know, you don't know what anybody's going to do. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, if you've been wounded in any way, shape, or form, which most of us have on some front like that, but if you've been wounded in the church, um, it is a honorable and noble thing to still get up and go back to another church. Because, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because after having it there, you know, it's like most people just go, <clears throat> the heck with it, you know. Uh, I just won't go to church anymore, and yet we're the body of Christ. I and mean, we, need, we need one another, don't we? You know, we need one another. <clears throat> and so... Um, you know, the Lord is gracious. The Lord is good. The Lord is kind. He is all of that. But all of that kindness and all of that goodness isn't always just to deliver us so we won't feel anything. Sometimes he wants us to feel certain things for others. And isn't that what it said of Jesus? Why he is a, a good high priest? Because he felt what we felt and he can uh, communicate with us and, and uh Amen. All right, let's see. Let me. Yeah, I just don't want to necessarily. Uh, this thing right here. Let's just end with this for right now. This thing of God. Us calling upon God. When I say us, I'm talking about this, the inner person here. I'm not just talking about the, the person called Randy. I'm talking about the person of fear and fretting and no, not trusting. And because maybe the Lord sees that many times bigger than he sees us because that's what we put forth to him. And so... So he sees all of this turmoil in us just because these outward things have come. And, and again, if he just takes away all of this, because that's what we pray, just take away all this outward trouble, I'll be fine. And the waters within us that were bubbling, the waters that were in us that were boiling, that were, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, Lord, you got to do something. They calm down. <clears throat> but we have not been changed. You know what I mean? We're not changed at all. It's just calmed down. Okay. Is the Lord more interested in fixing our outward things or are we the work of God? We're the work of God. We're the workmanship. We're his workmanship. And so <clears throat> um, I have found that a lot of times when we get the inward part right and we're with the Lord, he's more than glad to remove that outward stuff. He really is, you know. But he, he wants us to be with him, not some sort of a, you know, freakish little weird child that goes, give me this, you know, you know what I mean? Give it to me now. You know, anybody ever see Willy Wonka? <laughs> give it to me now, you know. And uh, he's going, you know, you need to see how ugly you are. So I'm not, you know, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to remove this now. What do you think of that? 
Well, you know, well, Jesus, if you're not going to do what I want and meet my needs when I want it, I'll just, I'll find somebody who will. I'll just turn to Satan. Oh, nobody would say that. But they would give up on Jesus and they'll go to something else, you know. So it's like, you, you know, and all of us know, all of us know that turmoil. There's not a one of us that doesn't know that turmoil. You know, when it comes to this, we're the disciples in the boat. And Jesus is the only one asleep at rest, okay? So we're all equal here. We all know that. <clears throat> but how we deal with not just the, the external circumstances, but how we deal with the Lord. Can we just turn to the Lord and we say, we say, Lord, I'm a mess. You know, I know that you could remove all of this and I would be calm again, but my calm wouldn't be because I'm at rest and I'm, I'm peaceful and then I have you. It would be because you fix everything for me and you're keeping me a spoiled child and I don't want to be a spoiled child anymore. I want to be with you where you're at. Lord, help the inward man of my heart. Help me to conform to the image of Christ. Can't go wrong with Jesus. Can't go wrong with more of Jesus. And so that becomes your goal. That becomes your prayer. And so then, <clears throat> man, he delivers you from stuff, and you don't even notice it in a certain sense because you weren't all freaking out about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's like a, some trial comes up, and you're just walking with the Lord anyway. And I think the devil does that, too. And I'm trying to quit here. I think the devil, the devil comes up, and the example I've used is that, you know, you have bad dreams. He gives you really bad, yucky dreams, you know. And, <clears throat> and so, you know, uh, uh, I had, then when I was in Bible school, I'd have bad dreams. And why not from some of the stuff that I went to? But the enemy would bring me bad dreams, and they were, some of them were just yucky and horrible. And, uh, uh, and I went to the Lord about it, and he says, well, don't worry about it. That's not, that's not who you are. That's just the enemy giving you that. You're not. Well, but, Lord, isn't that all? I mean, how could that stuff come up? Isn't that, isn't that a testimony? He says, no, I, you are born again, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, I did, you know, the new covenant, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Yes, Lord. He said, okay, then believe me. And so, so the next night, went to bed. Enemy gave me a bad dream, <clears throat> and when I woke up, I, you know, I just decided instead of reacting, I woke up, I, I actually did this. I went just like this, and I went, what a great night's sleep. Oh, how wonderful. And, uh, and I did that two or three times, you know, and I saw a picture in my mind of the devil, the, the demon that came to give me those dreams every night, and now he's here, a week is up, and he has to report back to Satan. And Satan's going, are you doing your job? This guy ain't getting them. You're not even getting through. I, I'm, getting, I, I'm putting them in there, and I don't know what's going on. You're fired. Get out of here. And, you know, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll quit. And uh, we'll come back for the next class. Take a break.